Nick, thank you so much for being here and visiting U.S. Capitol today. My name is Teresa Grobecker, and I'm here with Nick. He is the CEO of S1 Biopharma. So tell me, what do you do and what is the focus of your company? First of all, thank you for having me here today. Uh, what do we do? So uh, the company, as you said, is S1 Biopharma. We work in the female sexual dysfunction space, although we do have a product for male desire. Uh, our focus is to uh, resolve and offer solutions for HSDD using a mechanism of action. The focus is on the brain rather than hormonal treatment. Um, we, we were spun out of a company called Burringer Engelheim. Um, the first drug that was ever invented for HSDD is called Flibanserin. That was invented by our chief medical officer, Robert Pike. And that drug sold for a billion dollars, although it only had a 10% efficacy, uh, margin of efficacy over placebo. Um, and from the learnings of that program, uh, we decided to it was the, the basis for the, the design of Lorexis, which is our lead drug. So we improved upon what we learned in that drug in Lorexis. So Nick, tell me about the pipeline of drugs that you have. Yeah, we have four drugs in our pipeline. The first drug is called Lorexis. It's indicated for HSDD in women. And then uh, the second drug is Orexa. It's for HSDD in men. And then we have a third drug, or ex, I mean, a drug called S1B 307, and that's indicated for female arousal dis or orgasmic disorder. And then the final drug is a, it's called S1B 3006, and that's for treatment resistant uh, sexual dysfunction. So it's a much stronger drug than the first three. Nick, tell me what is the market size and what is your, your total addressable market? for the female population here in the United States and internationally. What does that look like? Yeah, so the market size is, the prevalence is about one in 10 women in North America and also in Western Europe based on two large scale studies called the Preside and the Wishes study. And that, that translates to about 12 million women in the United States. The, the market size in terms, of, in terms of dollar amount is estimated to be five billion a year. That's a Morgan Stanley estimate globally. So um, what's interesting though is, is in order to capture that market, we assume, that number assumes a, a restorative treatment. And so far there have been two drugs. As of last week, the second one was approved. So now there are two drugs approved for female HSTD. And those uh, drugs have an efficacy of about 10 to 16 percent. So that that is not <laughs> that we don't know how much of the five billion dollar per year market that you can capture with the drug with those uh, figures. And those those drugs qualify as a mild aid. Uh, what, why we're very excited about Lorexis is that it's we believe it's the first drug that has the potential to capture a very large portion of that five billion dollar market we have a 58 percent remission rate what that means is it's i don't want to say the word cure but if you for in our phase two studies patients 58 percent of patients who came in with severe hsdd within with within less than four weeks did not qualify for having hsdd anymore so there aren't even remission numbers for the other two drugs. But what we can compare in separate tests with the other two drugs is that they had a 10 to 16% margin of efficacy over control, whereas we had a 38% margin of efficacy over our control. And we also had a 76% responder rate, whereas, for example, the, the drug that was approved last week, Vilisi, had a 25% responder rate based on a two-point uh, on the two-point FSFI desire scale, which is uh, the primary endpoint for paste for all of the clinical trials. So you're talking about a responder rate of more than three times with Lorexis over two drugs, and you know that one was sold for one billion dollars in cash the day after it was approved. And then uh, the drug that I was referring to that was approved last week on Friday, was uh, they outlicensed North American rights for a total of $465 million in biobucks. So that's for a drug that we have three times the responder rate and it, there's no remission on their drug. And it's also an injectable, 
um, and it also causes nausea. And our drug, uh, we don't anticipate nausea. So Nick, your drug in its trial phases has much higher efficacy than your competitors. Why is that? Right, uh, interesting. Well, I think it's because the, the other, there's only three drugs in development in the global pipeline for HSDD. Uh, one of which our C chief medical officer was the head of that program and, and was on the patents and invented that, pro that drug for HSDD. But I think it's because with those first two drugs, they, they weren't invented for HSDD. They weren't, they weren't designed from, from concept and birth solely for the task of, of addressing the root cause of hypoactive sexual desire disorder. Whereas with Lorexis, we, we, we looked at the problem and we, we used the Kinsey dual control model. We also used what we learned from the Flibanserin program and asked ourselves, how can we solve this problem without going to some perfunctory asset that was acquired from you know, the latest drug out of Harvard or whatever. We, we just wanted to solve the problem and then worry about monetization later. And so we, we deliberately chose drugs that would be first very, very safe um, and, and, uh, and then develop the efficacy and, and see if we could find uh, a, a perfect, just basically it was a custom tailored drug design in order to solve HSDD. So Nick, yes. this is amazing what you've created. Tell me about your background. Yeah, so uh, well, I did my undergrad right here across the bay at Berkeley, and then uh, I studied neuro-oncology, that's brain tumors at UCSF, and then I attended medical school, uh, but I didn't finish that program, uh, instead opting to attend business school and, and just learn about what was out there in the world, kind of trying to find myself like many of us do. And then I got an offer at Novartis to, to do their leadership development rotational program, it was kind of fell in my lap and, and it was uh, interesting. I learned a lot and I, they, I, I learned a lot there and it, it focused me on drug development. And then from there, I became the global controller of research and development at Bayer who invented aspirin and heroin. And, and then after doing that for a few years, I thought, um, you know, maybe I want to contribute using all of my my background in a more direct way. So in 2008, I left and began the process of building the company and then together with John and with our chief medical officer, Robert Pike, we, the three of us, co-founded the company and started in 2011. That is amazing. And what about the rest of your team members? What's, what's that glue? What's that magic between your team? Yeah, that magic is that we are not a commercialization first company. We were expressly created to address the need, an unmet medical need for one in 10 women uh, that suffer this, this deep distress. And the scientists uh, who, who are on our team, they already treat patients for HSDD. And, and we, we all did this, These, this is driven by the people that, the healthcare providers, the scientists, and not by the dollar, not by commercialization. So, so it really, it's no surprise to us that our efficacy is, is more than three times better than the other two drugs that have already been approved. And it's no surprise to us that it, we had no dropouts due to set of events. Uh, our safety and tolerability is superior in separate tests. Um, uh, yeah, so basically it's because we, we designed uh, a drug specifically for the indication and uh, it was, it's uh, TLC, that's why. And those are the best projects. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. So tell me, what are some <clears throat> of those benefits that you see, not on the medical side maybe, but more on the human level of the outcome? Yeah. Right, of, of people who use and utilize what you've created. Lorexis, yes. Yeah. So, you know, I, the medical need is really what has driven, driven our efforts. And, you know, who am I to argue with 12 million women, right? I mean, I'm, 
if they say that they come and they they are so emotional and and for example at the at the FDA hearing for Addy we heard the story of woman after woman after woman of all ages from young 20s all the way post menopausal and they came with their families and they have explained that unless you have HSDD and unless it causes you tremendous distress or until one day you suddenly lose your own desire and your identity changes and it puts stress on your relationships that um, you know you don't know how difficult this disorder is and so as long as there's a, a strong medical need that is so emotional uh, and very very intimate um, then you know we we know how to we believe that we know how to solve and address that issue and so that's what we're doing we're, we're using what we know in order to solve a problem that 12 million women in the US want solved. Yeah, because it impacts people's relationships, their families, happiness at the end of the day. It's really a beautiful thing that you've done to, to help women. Thank you. Yeah. Nick, tell me about the Lorexis phase two results. Yeah, phase two A, we had, uh, the numbers are very straightforward. We had a 76% responder rate which uh, in comparison to the other two, at least by Lisa, I know the responder rate was 25%. And then uh, we had a 38% margin of efficacy over control, which the other two that have been approved were 10 to 16%. Typically uh, for CNS indications, if you expect, in order to have FDA approval, you need to reach around 20% of efficacy over control. However, because the indication is so there's such an unmet medical need. There's 26 sex drugs for men and zero for women that the FDA approved the first two drugs with half their normal threshold. So that's like getting into Harvard with C minuses. But we are coming with a double A plus. So we have a 38, we almost have twice of the normal threshold. So far I'm 2A, two, two so we have a little bit of room uh, for, for error in 2B. Uh, so 38% margin of efficacy over control. We had a, the other two drugs didn't register a remission rate. We had a 58% remission rate. So that just, it's a potential, Lorexis is a potentially restorative treatment. And that's really, if there's one takeaway that we want potential participants in this, in this private placement to understand, it's that these they're not really equivalent to uh, Lorexis is not equivalent to the other two the other two are great options we're very glad they're out there um, but they qualify more as mild aids as options um, whereas Lorexis is potentially truly restorative with a 58 percent remission rate it's so rare to find a drug that goes to market with the idea of um, curing is not the right term but that's kind of where my mind goes like you want a more permanent solution so the person reaches full personhood and can go on with life without dependency on your drug, right? So yes. I just think that's so rare and unique and special and it shows how much you really care for the patient. It's amazing. Yeah, thanks. And it shows that we just got lucky in a lot of ways <laughs> that we we thought, um, you know, we tried a lot of different drugs you know, in the space. and. Um, you know, we really got lucky with this one. We, in fact, the results were so good the first time in our pilot studies that we had to run it again, and uh, yeah, they, they were the same. And so we basically discovered a synergistic effect. And you know, we we haven't to the to the scientific community standards demonstrated why there's that synergy or or what that synergy is, but to have that kind of responder rate. Um, with you know with basically it's a combination product and uh, you know uh, i'd be happy to get into the specifics of the mechanism of action you know with uh, with whomever was interested but we have a we we have a synergistic effect that we were very fortunate to find that's amazing and yeah you touched on a good point if anyone has any questions they're welcome to reach out to you directly yeah. or to me as your banker or they could read about the details um, in the U.S. Capitol data room because all of this is available or, there because we've done our underwriting. And they can also meet with our entire scientific advisory board. Uh, we, our board members, we share them with, with a lot of, with our other two competitors. 
Uh, it's a very small neighborhood, the, the experts in, in, in HSDD and female sexual dysfunction. And um, the FDA obviously respects their advice because mm -hmm. it, it, they were the, on the advisory panel and committee and um, are really responsible for taking care of the 12 million women who have HSDD. So Nick, how does Lorexis compare to the other drugs in the HSDD space? Yeah, uh, so historically, the it's a young indication and the first drugs that were um, tested for HSDD were testosterone, various formats of testosterone. Mm -hmm. uh, first Procter & Gamble developed the Intrinsa patch, which was a, a, a patch uh, that, that uh, was transdermal for testosterone. That didn't demonstrate enough of a, of a separation, so it didn't get approved, but it was close. And then, um, so there were a whole host of other testosterone products. Then Phlebanserin, uh, that was again invented by our chief medical officer over at Beringer Engelheim. That drug is, is similar to ours and what that does operates on, so, so the prevailing understanding of, of central control of sexual desire is this model called the Kinsey dual control model, which states that with an increase of serotonin activity in the synapse, you have satiety, so that 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 kills desire. If you're satisfied, it reduces your sexual desire. On the other side of that seesaw mechanism is is stimulation, and we get that from dopamine and norepinephrine in the synapse. And what flibanserin does is it acts on the satiety part. It it interrupts the satiety, but in order to do that, it requires such a dose that's prescribed at 100 milligrams that at that point you start to experience a steep decline in tolerability and what we learned from that was that if we instead of just pushing down on on the seesaw why don't we push up and pull down on the seesaw and we can use lower and safer doses to achieve that effect by act by acting by torquing that uh, seesaw it turned out to be very effective uh, so uh, as, as compared to 10% efficacy over, over control, we have a 38% efficacy over control. Also, because of that steep decline, uh, that steep cliff after 100 milligrams that I was talking about, phlebanserin, it's contraindicated alcohol. So you can't have alcohol, there's a black box warning with phlebanserin. Whereas because we're sub-therapeutic doses and because our mechanism of action is a uh, there's a perceived cancellation of side effect with the two components in Lorexis. So very tolerable and we do not anticipate any contraindication to alcohol. So that's different from phlebanserin. Uh, with Vilesi, you have a 10 to 16% efficacy over control and it's an injectable. Um, you know, they, originally they went out as an intranasal but it caused hypertension. And so they got a complete response letter which was a rejection and then they thought, okay, well, We'll switch, it, we'll switch it to a, an injectable, and they were able to get around the hypertension uh, issue. So uh, it's an injectable. It also causes nausea. It's recommended that uh, patients consider taking an antiemetic, something that makes you less nauseous, with so a drug to help the drug. <laughs> It seems really uh, complicated with uh, only 10% efficacy. 10 to 16% efficacy, yeah. yeah, yeah. Versus 58% remission. So yeah. with a drug that we don't think will be contraindicated, we've already been granted 505B2 status. So that means that the FDA is very comfortable with the safety and tolerability known profiles of our actives. Uh, so in terms, of, um, in terms of safety and toxicity, we have reduced uh, regulatory risk just by definition of that pathway. Also, because our drug compares favorably uh, to phlebanserin and Bilesi, um, both in terms of safety and tolerability as well as efficacy, we believe that since both of them were approved, uh, that our regulatory path risk should be significantly less. That's amazing. So the next question I'm going to ask you is how confident are you that you will have similar results in phase 2B and Y? Yeah. Uh, we. I. We feel very confident that we'll have similar results in phase 2B because our phase 2B is essentially like uh, it's structured very similarly to our phase 2A. So we're not changing much. 
Um, you know, it'll be placebo controlled, uh, double blinded study, very standard. We've met with FDA. The structure of the program has been vetted. It's a very boring, um, very reliable, very predictable uh, clinical trial. So uh, because it's boring and very, very standard and the FDA has given us at least uh, you know, to date its stamp of imprimatur on the design. And because it's not different, we're not doing anything uh, too overly ambitious. Uh, we, we really expect a similar result. That is so exciting. I'm so happy for you. And on top of that, uh, we have such a margin of error that we have room. So whereas the best that the other two drugs have achieved in terms of efficacy was 16%, we're already at 38%. So even if we go down to half of that, we'll still be beating the competition and much safer in separate tests. That is amazing. Congratulations to you and all your success. So happy for you, Nick. Thank you. John, it's great to have you here. You are the CFO of S1. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks a lot for having me. This is great. Yeah, awesome. So uh, the question I would like to ask you is sure. what is the purpose of the company's raise right now? Yeah. So this raise is really just directed at conducting our phase 2B study for Lorexis. Uh, phase 2B for Lorexis is really just the, one of the most important uh, steps that we can do. Uh, we think there's going to be a lot of value uh, generated with this step because it'll really just prove to the, the broader public as well as to a lot of the pharmaceutical companies out there just how good you know, Lorexis is. Uh, so we'll be conducting a 150 patient phase 2B study. Uh, that'll take us uh, less than 18 months to complete. We'll call it uh, two years to complete the study. Uh, then we're also going to allow another half year to allow for uh, deal options at the end of that study. Uh, afterwards, we think that there's a, a very good opportunity for an IPO at that point in time, but we also have conversations with a good number of strategic partners that may be interested in uh, in stepping in at that point. John, tell me, what level of interest have you seen from the industry so far? Sure, yeah, pretty good interest. Uh, we've already outlicensed actually South Korea uh, to CKD Pharmaceuticals out there, a great partner. Uh, we are in conversations, late stage conversations even, uh, with some companies for other you know, non-US regions. On top of that, we've had conversations with a good number of uh, large, actually anywhere from small, mid to large pharmaceutical companies uh, for even North American or global rights to Lorexis. Uh, and on top of that, we've actually even received a term sheet from one publicly traded company. That is amazing. So you're waiting for the the right time to evaluate some of these options in greater detail. Absolutely. We just think that there's so much value to be created by taking at least this next step by ourselves here internally, if not beyond. Absolutely. So tell me, how is the company capitalized to date? Sure. Uh, we've been capitalized through three different rounds of convertible notes. Uh, this will be our first preferred stock offering. Incredible. That's great. I wish you all the, the most and best continued success as you continue to grow financially. And if you have any questions, right, about this raise, if our investors have questions, how do they reach out to you? Oh, well, we'd be happy to talk to anyone that's interested. Uh, you can either reach out directly through US Cap Global uh, or you can contact us directly at the information provided. That's awesome. Thank you so much, John, and thank you, Nick. All thank the you. best and continued success. Thank you very much. Thank you.